excited to welcome to the show this week, Morgan Richard. She is a financial planner. We're going to be talking all about how to plan out your Bitcoin savings and investments. So Morgan, thanks so much for joining me. I've had the pleasure of having Pierre on the show. He was actually one of my first guests, but first time for you. So welcome. Thanks for having me on. I am, uh, I guess, first time guest, but long time listener. Oh, well, thank you so much. So let's first actually hear a little of your backstory. Um, how did you get to be where you are? How'd you get into financial planning? Maybe a little of how you met Pierre. I'd love to hear all of it. Yeah, sure. So I started my career in finance um, during the global financial crisis. So um, a very fun time <laughs> to get started in the industry for sure. My first job, I um, I was literally hired three days before Bear Stearns went out of business. Um, oh and I remember even wondering whether or not I should call to ask if I still had a job, but I didn't want to like remind them that they, <laughs> that they had hired me, you know, I didn't want to be yeah. like, Oh, you know, Hey, am I still going to have a job and, uh, remind them maybe to not have me come on the first day, but no, they were yeah. fine with me coming. And, um, I was an equity options trader to start. So wow. I basically, um, I got coffee really more so than anything else. I got coffee for guys on the floor of the American Stock Exchange back when that still existed. And um, they promoted me, which was nice of them. And um, I worked in an upstairs office for a bit, learning how to trade and trading a small account. And then they moved me actually um, back down onto the floor of the Amex to trade equity options as a market maker and a wow. specialist in specific stocks. Um, and I did that for actually two years. And then... Um, it just seemed like it wasn't a good fit for me personally. Um, it was very fast paced. It was, um, there's a lot of yelling. Um, it's just not good for my, I guess for my soul, honestly, if I, if I really want to like think about it in terms of like me holistically and like where my life path was going, like me yelling in a pit with a bunch of men wasn't necessarily what I wanted to be doing. And also um, at the time, a lot of these things were becoming more computerized um, and trading was becoming more like high frequency traders and these pools yeah. and these upstairs offices um, who were computer programmers, not like the old fashioned guys who traded. And so I took a job actually kind of begrudgingly in wealth management, but it ended up being what I do now. Um, I worked at Merrill Lynch then for a couple of years and worked at UBS for a couple more years for the same team. We just moved firms. And that I think was really pivotal in my career because I realized that working at these large places, it wasn't going to be where I wanted to be. Um, it was very clear to me that I loved working with clients and that I liked what I was doing and just really didn't like where I was doing it. And so I came across um, some independent firms that were larger, not realizing that you actually could just start a small shop. Um, and then I heard from this guy who I'd studied with um, the CFA when I, this was many years ago, he said he was just starting a registered investment advisor. And I was like, you or you, <laughs> you know, I kind of had this reaction of like, oh, like a person could just do that. Oh, okay. Like I'll just do that then. So that's literally what I did. I mean, it's not, I wouldn't call that the best business plan, but um, yeah, I just sort of flew by the seat of my pants, started my own business at 28 and um, 10 years later, here we are. So uh, <laughs> that's how I got into it. In the meantime, though, um, I met Pierre. Um, we actually met because of our love of Austrian economics. Um, I was, we had an oh, online yeah, dating I know profile. This story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> An online dating profile. And he, um, was searching for his, um, his love or anywhere really in the world or maybe in America. I'm not sure exactly. Um, and he typed in Rothbard and I happened to have Rothbard, maybe probably the only person who had Rothbard in her profile. <laughs> and, uh, we met because of that. And so Murray Rothbard holds a very sweet place in our hearts. Um, <laughs> and then that I also um, was my Bitcoin journey where it started as well. I love it. That's amazing. Um, such, a, such a great story. And I always love to hear those. Well, you have such an amazing resume and it's awesome that you went out on your own. I think there's nothing better than just being your own boss. Um, you now manage Origin Wealth Advisors. It's an investment advisory firm. You're also a Bitcoin financial consultant with a firm called Money Owners. Um, you're the author of Personal Financial Quick Start Guide and the co-host of Bitcoin for Advisors podcast. So a lot going on there. So tell me a little bit about, you know, why you were sold on Bitcoin being the future and something that has to be part of everyone's portfolio. Yeah, so that was definitely an evolution over time. I would say if you had asked me that question 10 years ago when I had first heard about Bitcoin, I probably would have just said, ah, it's like some niche thing that libertarians like me are interested in. Um, but not necessarily. I didn't have the same vision, I would say, 10 years ago that like 
my husband basically had of like, this is going to be the next world global reserve currency, you know, um, I, I could see that happening, you know, over, you know, 200 years or something like that, because in the fiat financial world, things move slowly. And so in my mind, it's like, okay, this new technology exists. And that's great, but it's going to take time. Um, and so I think that we balance each other in that regard because he's incredibly optimistic and I tend to think like that we have to be more patient about when things are <laughs> going to happen. Um, and so, but, um, so I, I heard about Bitcoin actually just as a libertarian before Pierre and I had even met. Um, I had read about it on Mises.org and thought that it was really interesting and thought that it was more interesting than gold. Mm -hmm. um, I liked gold in portfolios because like I felt like it helped with inflation, but I didn't really feel like it did more than that. Um, gold was just sort of one of these things where it acted as a store of value. And if you looked at long run returns, that's literally all it did. And so if anything, gold was just one of those things where it acted as a diversifier and helped you in times where there was maybe fear or extra excess inflation, but it didn't necessarily help you in the long run if you actually look at the studies um, and what the long run returns have done. And so from that perspective, like, it was hard because as a libertarian, right, you want to be like, OK, just put all your money in gold and move on. But then realizing that that actually is not a solution for clients um, made it very clear that like I had to look to towards other options. Um, and so starting to include Bitcoin in small percentages in clients portfolios, um, we started doing that around 2016 when people started asking about it. Um, and then as I got more comfortable and read up more on the rules and the regulations about what was appropriate and what we could actually recommend as a registered investment advisor, um, really kind of by 2020 had gotten pretty much all of my clients involved. Um, and now at this point, um, we have clients with significant holdings, which is great. Um, and we're using it, we're looking at it as a long-term savings vehicle. So when I look at an investable portfolio, we don't actually consider that to be investment. Um, and I think that that distinction really needs to be made in people's portfolios because Right. You have money that you maybe want to allocate towards investment and then you have money that you're saving for specific goals, um, either short term or long term. And so then from there, right, the short term or long term, you have to decide, OK, do I want to invest that money or do I want to just save it? Um, and this is not something that we've ever been able to do before prior to having something like Bitcoin or even I mean, gold, I guess you could use. But again, like we were saying, it's not necessarily the best possible way for somebody to get the you know, the long term returns that they want to have. And so. Bitcoin needs to be included so that people don't have to invest beyond their risk tolerances. Um, but the fiat world that we currently live in forces people to do that. It continually forces people to take the money that they earned and basically use the S&P 500 as a savings account rather than it actually being what it's meant to be, which is taking risky investments and hoping for potential expected return as a result of that. Um, and so we distinguish this in client portfolios. Um, and it's definitely been an evolution. I won't say that from the beginning, from 2013, when I started getting into Bitcoin, that we did that for clients. We certainly did not. But I definitely um, have evolved how I look at this for client portfolios over the last five years or so to, to like really have it be a key point in people's portfolios. Coin Stories is brought to you by BitDeer, where the power of Bitcoin mining is at your fingertips. As a publicly traded leader, BitDeer's global reach and scale means they're everywhere you need them to be, ensuring you're part of the thriving Bitcoin economy. BitDeer's not just mining, they are industry pioneers, and BitDeer stands alone as the only vertically integrated, technology-focused Bitcoin mining company. What does that mean? Well, they're not just deploying, but developing the latest tech to make Bitcoin mining more efficient and effective. With the industry's most experienced leadership team, Innovation is in their DNA, and it shows with a quarter of their workforce dedicated to research and development, pushing the boundaries of what's possible in Bitcoin mining. And now they're leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at bitdeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. Well, I really want to break down the difference between savings and investment because I have to be honest with you, Morgan, before I learned about Bitcoin, I really didn't understand the difference and I probably conflated those two terms because we have gotten to a place where we're so financialized and you can't save just in dollars. Um, you're supposed to be able to with hard money. It's supposed to be about savings, acquiring capital and then investing that in something productive, right? But today, investing basically means, you know, putting money into the stock market or you turn your house into a savings account. Um, can you talk a little bit about really the difference and why those two words need to be separated? 
Yeah, definitely. So savings is something that we use to minimize uncertainty in in like future uncertainty. And so when we think about um, really anything in your day to day life, right? Like you can you can maybe know what you're doing for the next week, you can maybe know what you're doing for the next month, but something unexpected can happen in the next hour, right? Something unexpected can happen in the next month, something certainly unexpected can happen in the next year, five years, 10 years. And so um, we can't know every single detail of our future life as much as people would like to plan. And even people like me, right, who plan for a living, right? We want to like know every single detail and check every box, but we can't do that because we don't know the future. And so having savings minimizes that uncertainty of the future. Having investment doesn't do that. And the reason why having investment doesn't do that is because you're relying on companies, um, you're relying on third parties, you're relying on so many different things risks basically between you and that investment to ensure that you're able to meet some sort of uncertainty in the future. And so there's just a lot more uncertainty <laughs> associated with investment. And especially if you put uncertainty on top of uncertainty, right, you have even more uncertainty. And so even with Bitcoin, right, because Bitcoin sometimes tends to be correlated with um, with traditional markets, right? And so if you're using Bitcoin, let's say, to help hedge you against short-term uncertainty, right, it's maybe not necessarily the right vehicle to use. And Bitcoiners don't like when I say that, but it is a fact, right? Bitcoin is volatile enough that that it doesn't make sense to use it for your emergency savings fund if something were to happen between next hour and you know even maybe five years from now. And so it's important to manage your level of savings so that you can be able to meet any short term, like you know, unexpected thing that would come up in your life, and also be able to meet any long term unexpected event that may come up in your life. And savings is the thing that does that, not necessarily investment. I think that's such an important distinction that investment really means it inherently carries risk. Um, and a lot of people do see Bitcoin as risky. And I think if they're watching this show, they probably know that the wrong allocation in their portfolio is zero. But is there a right one, depending on who you are, your age, what you're planning for? I mean, how do people decide, should I be 20% Bitcoin, 50% Bitcoin, 99% Bitcoin? What do you tell them? Yeah, I mean, I could do like a six hour presentation on just your one question, but I'll, I'll try to be as precise as I can. So um, I like to think about it as allocation buckets. So for most people, what it's going to mean is that if you've got any kind of emergency savings reserve, if you've got at least three to six months worth of expenses in fiat where you knew if you know, let's say, God forbid, you had some sort of illness or you lost your job or something happened to a family member and you had to take off time from work. People don't often think about that. They're like, oh, well, I'm 32 and healthy and there's nothing wrong with me. Nothing's going to happen to me. But then they don't realize, you know, they have aging parents or grandparents or another family member that potentially they would have to take care of and maybe leave a job or take time off from work, the whole thing. And so there are a number of things that can happen in your life. There are also a number of things that are, so there's some bad things that can happen, right? There are also good things that can happen, right? Like maybe you unexpectedly are having the child you always wanted to have, right? And then now you're taking off time from work or, you know, you're, you want to start a business, right? It's not just only bad things that are uncertain in the future, right? There are also good things that can happen that are uncertain in the future that also require funds. And so a good rule of thumb is definitely a three to six month emergency reserve, especially I would even err on the six month side if you're going to be one of these people who wants to be 100% in Bitcoin. Um, we don't deter clients from having savings. I look at Bitcoin as savings. And so if a client comes in and they've got an appropriate emergency reserve and they want to do planning and they've got, you know, the rest of their assets, 100 percent in Bitcoin, we're I'm not here to say you shouldn't have savings. You should have investment. What I'm here to do, though, is to show the potential risks to maybe having too many, too much of your assets in Bitcoin and not thinking about why you might want to potentially have investment instead. And so for most people, right, the 100 percent allocation is probably not going to make sense. Those are going to be like the most hardcore of Bitcoiners who maybe don't they're young, they don't have a lot of other, you know, uncertain things maybe happening in their life, they maybe don't have a family, they, you know, right, I like I kind of think of like the single 25 year old Bitcoiner guy, like is kind of that was probably an appropriate allocation for for everybody else. though, it's going to be less than that. <laughs> and so um, I think it's going to really depend on like your your risk tolerance, right, for sure, you have to be able to weather like the up and ups and downs of Bitcoin, um, your understanding of the technology, the more you understand Bitcoin, the more likely you're going to be able to stay invested during these periods of high volatility, whether it be up or down. Um, and then it's just going to be like what other factors in your life are contributing to your risk tolerance. So risk tolerance kind of breaks down into ability to take risk and willingness to take risk. And often when people think of risk tolerance, they only think of the willingness piece, which is like, 
do I go bungee jumping or not? You know, that kind of a thing. Whereas the ability part is like, okay, how stable is my income? Um, how much in assets do I have? Somebody who has really stable income has more ability to take risks than somebody who gets who's paycheck to paycheck or freelance, right? They don't know when their next paycheck is going to come in. Um, somebody who has a lot of assets, right? You've got a billion dollars. It doesn't really matter if you put half of it in Bitcoin and it goes to zero, right? Not that I'm saying Bitcoin's going to zero, but I'm just saying from a risk perspective, right? He still has a half a billion dollars. So it's not a big deal. Whereas somebody who maybe has a hundred dollars, right? And that hundred dollars is everything to them. <laughs> they put all hundred in Bitcoin, right? That might be a problem. And so we can get into why somebody in that risk bracket might actually want to be hundred percent Bitcoin, but just for the purposes of your question is to stay on track. <laughs> I will uh, keep going forward. Um, and so there are just a multitude of factors within ability in and of itself, like how frequently you get paid, how long you've been investing or understand savings and so forth. So all of that goes pay, plays into ability. And so then what you do is you kind of combine these two things. And what we often see in, let's say, couples is that like, one or the other has different ability or you have the same ability to take risk, right? Because you're a household, but you have different willingnesses to take risk. And so maybe the husband has very high willingness to take risk, but the wife doesn't really have very high willingness to take risk at all, right? That's usually typically what we see. Sometimes it could be the opposite, but it's, oh, it's it? usually not. In which case, right, you have to combine those risk tolerances, which I think is really hard for people. And so in a couple type situation, you wouldn't want to be 100% Bitcoin if one had, you know, if everybody's ability is the same, but willingness is different, right? You need to compromise on willingness. And so um, what you don't want, right, is like your partner can't sleep at night anymore because of the Bitcoin allocation that you created. What we found, though, is that for most people who you know have been in Bitcoin for a while, really understand the technology, um, have the appropriate emergency savings fund and who have other goals besides just stacking Bitcoin, that the appropriate allocation is actually much higher than people think. And it really is somewhere between 40 and 50 percent is kind of where clients have landed. I've I've at least seen. Um, and so that's a huge difference than what I was saying people should have five years ago. Five years ago, like I thought, you know, oh, you know, a one to 10% allocation was fine. Um, what I'm seeing though is that people actually don't want to be in these traditional markets. And it actually makes sense that you wouldn't want to be in these traditional markets. Um, and especially with what's going on in bonds, right? I actually think it's riskier for people to have these huge bond portfolios than it would be to have a larger savings in Bitcoin. And so we're starting to balance that with like, macro from a macro perspective what is going on right now with like also everything that we've discussed about risk tolerance and how people can save rather than invest wow that was a lot of really useful information i i wanted to ask you though well if a person has okay so if a person has their six month emergency reserves and they have their fiat to take care of them if something happens and they let's say they have their house so they're they're all set they've got a roof over their head why not put all the rest of it into Bitcoin? You mentioned that you do recommend investments depending on their risk tolerance. Why and what kinds? Yeah, so what I've found is that people have other goals and these goals generally, they take place over shorter time periods. And so even if you've got that six month emergency reserve, maybe you are saving to, I don't know, start a business in three or five years, um, take this crazy travel trip where you take a sabbatical from work and then you also travel around the world. Um, maybe your goal is to homeschool your kids. Um, maybe your goal is to start a B branch. I don't know. You know, it's like we, there's a number of things that people want to do. We see people come in all the time who want to be 100 percent Bitcoin and then they realize, oh, actually, like I want to go buy a farm. Um, and so it's okay to not have be 100% in Bitcoin, even though, right, even if you think that Bitcoin is going to be the best investment for the long for the long term, right, there might be other reasons why you invest in other projects. Um, for some Bitcoiners, right, it's just really important for them to invest in Bitcoin itself. And so um, like they want to be part of, let's say, either venture funds or they want to be part of literally giving um, capital to like open source developers or something like that. And so um, these are not like they're not rational choices from a like an expected return standpoint. Right. Um, it's not going to be more profitable to have a farm than it is to own Bitcoin for 60 years. Right. Like I, I, I can just I mean, maybe I shouldn't be going on a limb on saying that, you know, because I'm making expectations about what the price of Bitcoin is going to be relative to that farm. But you can sort of see right where I'm headed with this. Right. It's the same thing with, let's say, if you own the stock market. Um, 
if you own the stock market, right, you have um, you have more liquidity potentially than you would with Bitcoin. Um, you do have access to companies. These companies are going to have multinational revenues all around the globe, right? There's going to be risks, obviously, associated with doing that. But you do get sort of a balance from doing that alongside of Bitcoin. Um, and potentially you would have at, like have reasons why you would want to have that in your portfolio and be able to use that rather than your Bitcoin when the time comes to maybe spend it on specific things. And so for some people, it's actually easier for them to spend their fiat, in which case we might want to have that reserve of investment in fiat to spend it, let's say, in retirement or spend it on a business or spend it on something, so forth. Um, and then save Bitcoin as like, OK, this is my legacy planning. Um, and yeah, it'll be there for me if I also need X, Y and Z thing in the future. But um, I actually want to I want this to be like how I pass down to my children or how I make a legacy for myself in some other way. I was talking to uh, Preston Pish, and, and he said this on a recent interview actually as well, but he um, he looked at the data over, I think it was maybe the last um, 10 years or up until 2021, maybe at any four-year cycle of Bitcoin. And if you took a portfolio that was 98% cash and just 2% Bitcoin, that outperformed if you had... Uh, I think it was 100% S&P or 98% S&P and 2% cash or something like that. And it it kind of blew my mind. I was really actually surprised by that. And he said that it was less volatile. Um, and so one thing that we've been hearing a lot, especially at the top of the year and all the spot Bitcoin ETF excitement is just that Bitcoin really outperforms when you look at risk adjusted returns. Do you talk about that with clients and what do you want to share about just how Bitcoin helps and how the sharp ratio performs and, and really can make moves and not add that much volatility? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I think that people often look at Bitcoin over short periods of time and they like to cherry pick the time period that they look at. And if you do that, of course, the sharp ratio is going to look terrible, right? You can look at any um, down period. Let's uh, let's call it like, I guess, early 2021 was it be April or May of 2021. And if you just took like May of 2021 to like the end of 2021, right? And you did the risk adjusted return, obviously the sharp ratio would be highly, highly negative. Um, and then people often say, you know, they'll do that with Bitcoin all the time. Um, if you're looking at Bitcoin, though, however, as a long term savings mechanism, right, a vehicle that you do long term savings with, then picking any short term period, right, anything that I would say is under even five years at this, at this point is going to skew what Bitcoin is actually supposed to do in your portfolio. And so we absolutely talk to clients about that, because on the one hand, it's kind of hard, right, because if you have a client who comes in, let's say, on January 1st of 2024, um, and then we have to, you know, show their what their portfolio was doing in any given period of time, right? The whole first year, everything is going to be short-term performance. And then the second year, short-term performance and the third year and so forth, right? And so yeah. it's not until a client's actually been in our practice for five plus years that we're finally like, hey, look at the long-term performance backward looking of your portfolio and how well it's done and that kind of a thing. And so um, if anything, what we do in my practice is we just try to kind of minimize those conversations in general, right? Like we show performance, but Really, what we're focused on is long term planning for clients. And if we are able to make sure that clients are consistently meeting their financial goals, then yeah, like we are doing our job. Um, and the risk adjusted return along the way, yes, is obviously great that you would have something like Bitcoin in your portfolio that would help with something like that. Um, but really from a from an individual standpoint, what I really think that everybody should be focusing on, whether you work with a financial planner or not, is whether or not you're actually able to meet the financial goals that you have um, and what those goals are. A lot of the times people don't even really think about that. They just think like, oh, okay, like I'm here on this earth and, you know, I want to have a nice house and I want to have kids and I want to put them through school or whatever it is, um, you know, but you don't necessarily think about what would really be meaningful to you in this life. What would help your soul? What would help your family? What would help you have a, your place in the world? What would help you be creative? What would help you just um, be a good part of or a good member of your community, right? There are all these other aspects to people's financial plans that are not, I don't think, really represented in the risk adjusted return of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin does help in all aspects of that. And so having this as a as like a critical piece in your portfolio will help you enable you to do all those other things that you want to do and focus on all those things that you want to do. I love that you brought that up because it's like you can't put a price on any of those things, but the one thing that I think would help most people achieve those is more economic empowerment and the ability to not stress so much about their finances so they can make choices and they can be more creative and they can take chances like starting their own business. And that's my hope for Bitcoin because I really honestly feel like 
at right now, the world, 8 billion people are just getting poor faster and faster. And with Bitcoin, they could hopefully start stopping, stop getting poor and start getting richer faster and faster. Right. <laughs> and like, think of just what that opens up. I don't know. I mean, I, I know that it's a, I don't know if it'll even happen in our, in our lifetimes. And I'm sure there are challenges ahead, but I do have so much hope because if we don't have that stress and we could just kind of, you know, actually provide value and be judged by the value that we provide. And I don't know, I think we would be more cooperative. I really do. And maybe again, I'm looking at it with rose colored glasses, but I, I think that if the money was not broken, we society would be better and we would create more amazing things. Do you agree? Totally. I totally agree. Yeah. I think also it just, it frees people up if they're not worried about their finances to do things that are actually meaningful. And the more we are wrapped up in the financialization of our world, the more we're focused on the material rather than, and like just putting ourselves in this material world rather than removing ourselves, which is what we're supposed to do. Right. I mean, I, I believe that there's a God and I believe that we are created for a reason and that we all have a special purpose here and that there's a Natalie on this earth because Natalie has a special mission and God doesn't need two Natalie's, right? There's only one Natalie and God doesn't need two Morgans. Right. So you and I have different missions and roles here in on earth, but if we are so focused on what our fiat money is doing and how much we're saving, (laughs) right? And what the government is doing with our money, then we can't do our actual purpose and mission here. Um, And to kind of put some numbers on this, right? Um, If you start with zero net worth, so not negative net worth, but if you start with zero net worth and you save 22 and a half percent of your pre-tax income um, and you do that consistently for let's call it 20 to 25 years, then you can retire. But that also assumes that you don't change your spending in any way over those 20 to 25 years. um, And that you're basically half of your money, more than half your money is either going to savings or it's going to the government in the form of taxes. And so it leaves very little left over. And so if you think about that, that means that people, they might not necessarily have the standard of living that the generation before them had because they can't afford that. And so if you just keep putting that on future generations, right, like that they have to scrimp and save every single little penny that they have to worry about every little thing, right? It's just a a layer of materialism put on top of everything that we do here. um, That is just, it's just not good for our souls. And it's not what we're meant to do here. No, absolutely. I mean, I covered this when I used to be a reporter, the fact that most people can't meet like a $400 emergency. People are not able able to retire. I mean, the cost of retirement today is astronomical compared to what people are able to save up, especially young people. And it's it's super sad because then you kind of lose hope. And I think that that all of a sudden trickles into so many aspects of society because if you have no hope, no matter how hard you work, you feel like you'll never get ahead, you'll never have enough. Um, where's what motivates you to then work or even be a good person, right? Because you're just so frustrated at that point. And it's almost like you're, you're stripped of, uh, some sense of your dignity. And I really am, I'm afraid if, if like Bitcoin doesn't take hold and help us in some way, I'm afraid for the next generation because we're seeing, um, you know, the fabric of our society kind of pull apart at the seams because people are getting so fed up. And then what do they call for? Bigger government so that they get more money when they're just like feeding the current system that's actually starving them. And it's just crazy. I totally agree. I totally agree. I think it kind of segues too into the ETFs because um, basically what you're, I mean, people are going to allocate to these ETFs, right? But the ETF in the end is not actually what's going to help us, right? People learning how to use Bitcoin and people actually yeah. owning Bitcoin and people taking self-custody, sending transactions around, trying out lightning, all of that stuff is what's going to propel people forward into what I believe is the future of money where we all take self-custody, right? And so the yeah. ETF to me is like, it's this noise along the way where people sort of get some assets tied up until they realize later that they actually need to have their money in self-custody, which will enable them really to do what you're saying, which is, you know, to live in this better world where we don't have these large higher powers of government and involved in every little thing, um, providing even more uncertainty with our money, right? Because we don't have any idea whether or not they're going to keep interest rates the same, cut them, raise them, how much money they're going to print, whether or not they're going to find a new war to print money for, right? Whether or not they're going to use executive powers to do things or if they're going to go through proper channels, right? We have no idea. And, you know, we can say, okay, we have a voice because we vote, but in the end, we really don't have a voice. Um, And so taking back, that power, right? Just removing them from being able to do those things is what's going to enable people to have a better future. It's time for another quick break to hear these messages from my partners. 
Next up, Bitcoin 2024, the world's largest Bitcoin conference is coming to Nashville this year. Come join us for three amazing days of keynotes, panels, networking events, and my Women of Bitcoin brunch. The Bitcoin conference is where I launched my podcast almost three years ago. You never know what can happen or who you can meet here. Head to b.tc slash conference and use the code HODL, H-O-D-L, for 10% off. Next up, CoinKite, which makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. This is the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. Next up, crowd health. Health insurance costs are sky high, and it's money that feels wasted if you don't need a doctor. By crowdfunding healthcare with other Bitcoiners, I get to avoid traditional insurance fees and support real people instead of mega corporations. Crowd health also works to reduce your medical bills, so the community's contributions cover more. Imagine spending just $100 a month on healthcare and investing the rest in Bitcoin. If you're interested, visit joincrowdhealth.com slash Natalie. All right, back to the show. Well, I certainly hope people do take self-custody. We always say not your keys, not your coins. Um, but with regards to the ETFs, I did want to ask you, I saw so many surveys that there are a lot of financial advisors who manage like $30 trillion worth of, uh, of investor money. They said they can't invest in Bitcoin unless there is an ETF and that they're going to be recommending that security. Can you talk a little bit about maybe the difference between those financial advisors and, and folks like you who have been advising to allocate to Bitcoin. And I'm sure your clients have been buying spot Bitcoin for all these years. Yeah, definitely. So it really depends on your compliance department. So in my case, compliance is me. Okay. <laughs> and so I do all the reading, right? I read up on what's going on. Um, I have a compliance consultant, obviously, that I rely on too. So it's not just me. Um, but like, at the end of the day, it's my decision about what we do in my practice. And so um, I've been keeping tabs on it. And as far as I'm concerned, right, like what the SEC has said about Bitcoin has been the same thing that they would say about bananas, orange juice, any commodity. Um, it's also related to people's houses, right? Like a house is not an investment. People like to say that it is, but it's not. And so we advise clients all the time outside of the purview of the SEC about whether or not they can afford the house they want to buy, right? To me, Bitcoin is that it's savings. It's you know, they can call it a commodity, they can call it whatever they want, but it's not an investment. Um, and they've all agreed that it's not an investment. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter to me what the SEC says about it. Um, their language has made it such that I can advise clients on it without it being a big deal. Um, and compliance departments, I would say they don't have as lackadaisical, I guess, an attitude. They want like direct you know, they want direct language from the SEC basically okay. saying, hey, you can allocate to Bitcoin spot, right? Um, mm -hmm. And because they don't have that direct language, I think if anything, they're just sort of dragging their feet. I think the other thing to consider also is that a lot of these advisors work for these large um, wire houses like Merrill Lynch and UBS that I mm -hmm. worked for. Um, and these places actually don't have the ability to make money on Bitcoin. And so mm -hmm. because they don't offer it as something that clients can buy directly from Merrill Lynch or UBS or any of them, right? They can't charge a commission on it. Mm -hmm. Um, because they, yeah, exactly. They don't have any place for these clients to custody it. So they can't charge an assets under management fee on it. So even if a client went, if they had some sort of relationship with Coinbase, they don't have a custody product in place for these clients. Right. And then also like they've got these research teams that are doing research on that, or maybe they're doing research on miners or whatever it is that they're doing. And so they're able to allocate their clients in that regard, right through the investment round. Um, but they're not able to actually have clients hold spot Bitcoin. And so the incentives are not there. Um, the compliance departments are definitely dragging their feet and then i would also say just the education of advisors in general like it's also just not there um and so there are platforms out there like learnbitcoin.io which are like geared towards people well, maybe not people like me but other advisors who are looking to help implement this in their practices or at least learn about it so they can make a decision or and and educate their clients about it um, but the vast swath of financial advisors are not necessarily doing the research that they need to be doing and the reason why they're not doing the research is because they can't do it in their practice anyways, because of compliance and everything else. And so, um, and the incentives. So I just feel like all around, there's a lot of issues there. And obviously if they have an investment product that's, you know, been rubber stamped by the SEC, then yeah, they'll get in immediately. And then maybe they'll do the education and so forth because they can now, and they can get paid on it and the incentives are aligned, but the incentives are aligned for the advisor and for these wirehouses, but they're not aligned for the client. And at the end of the day, if you're not with an independent financial planner who is not associated with 
um, these places where they basically double deal and double dip on like how clients are paying them, then at the end of the day, you're not going to get objective advice. And it doesn't matter how many designations they have or how they say that they're conflict free. They can't be because their duty is to their firm and not to the client first. Great points. Thank you so much. Um, I want to turn now to talking about protecting your wealth, uh, protecting your Bitcoin. So can you talk a little bit about if you advise people to set up trusts and in what scenario should people set up trust? Should they put their Bitcoin in a trust? What do you say? Yeah, so it's really going to depend on your state. So um, people don't like to think about this because really the reason why you would use a trust is because you're going to die. <laughs> and so we're all going to die right one day. Um, hopefully, State you know, planning. you and I are yeah, pretty we got young. a plan, yeah. <laughs> you got a plan for death, but, you know, we're probably not going to die anytime soon. But, you know, people do die every single day. And so um, the problem right now is this. If you die um, and you have your Bitcoin just in a hardware wallet, right, you can make the decision as a Bitcoiner to say, well, nobody knows about my hardware wallet. And therefore, you know, my wife knows where it is and she'll just go collect it and then she'll hold that hardware wallet and so forth. Right. But if for whatever reason your wife needs to, for whatever reason, bring that Bitcoin back into um, into the fiat world. Um, or some of that Bitcoin, or even, you know, $100 worth of that Bitcoin, right? All of a sudden, where's that money coming from? And so because we do live in the surveillance state, unfortunately, right, you can't just sort of keep Bitcoin on the side unless you intend to always keep it on the side until Bitcoin becomes the next global reserve currency, in which case trust planning is going to make sense. Um, right now, there's no way for people to purchase Bitcoin as a, like in a joint account of any way. So that alone would be a reason to hold it in a trust. If you're a married couple and you want to have like your wife or your husband not to have to go through probate just because um, you died and your Bitcoin is now in a, in a hardware wallet somewhere, um, having a trust will at least make it such that your Bitcoin doesn't go through probate. The reason why you don't want it to go through probate is that majority of states actually have a public probate process. So what this means is that anything that's not in trust or in retirement accounts or in, let's say, a life insurance style policy, that kind of a thing, is going to become public knowledge. And so literally what they do is you die and then they produce a public docket of all of your assets that are um, that you died with. Um, and the reason why they do that is because they don't know what creditors you have. So you might have, I don't know, like a bunch of credit card debt or other debts that you can't discharge or a SBA loan that people took during 2020 that's not dischargeable. So now your creditors say, oh, here's the public docket. And uh, oh, look, they have Bitcoin stored at this address. Um, and so, oh, look, they have, you know, 5.8 Bitcoin stored at this address. Great. We'll seize that, you know, like that sort of a thing. Oh, and wow. so, um, majority of states, that actually is the case. Um, in Texas, that's not the case. In Texas, it's a private probate process, which means that not everybody can just look up, oh, hey, um, John Doe died. And now I can see that he has 5.8 Bitcoin and I'm going to go, um, stalk his house and rob his wife, that kind of a thing. Um, it's a public pro uh, private process, excuse me. And so a creditor would have to actually, um, go to the courts in Texas and produce, evidence that they were actually owed money, in which case then that docket would be released wow. to them and they would be able to get the money. And so for most people, a trust is going to make sense from for that reason too, right? If you're not, if you have minor children um, and you're not necessarily passing the Bitcoin to them, but you have a husband or wife that you want them to receive it and not have it be public, then a trust is a great place. Um, and just mm -hmm. a regular, like a revocable living trust. We're not talking like an irrevocable one where you give it to children and so forth. Um, we do do the irrevocable ones for families, but that's when you're in a situation where you don't actually need this money. You want to make gifts um, during your lifetime and doing that. I mean, we could talk about that forever and that would require, you know, specific situation um, discussions about when, when that would or would not make sense. Um Wow, that is fascinating. I actually didn't know that. Now I want to look up my state. <laughs> um, anything else you want to share just about estate planning? And I, I, I really think that even though we are obviously advocating for self custody, I just think that so many people see it as a as a hurdle, especially those just new to Bitcoin. Um, and and I'll admit, when I was first starting to put my Bitcoin onto a cold storage wallet, it was terrifying. Waiting, like I would send you know little bits at a time because. You just you're waiting for the confirmations and you're just hoping that you checked all the, you know, the the letters and, and numbers. And it is kind of, there's a scary component to it until you get very used to it. So I understand um, that there are people who who think, you know, the the idea that I would be even with collaborative custody, just basically trusting that no one loses the seed plate or, or what have you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what's the best way to sort of safe self custody your Bitcoin, but also plan for, you know, an emergency that happens? Like if you're if you're not able to access your Bitcoin if you pass away, um, what's the best way to plan for those kinds of 
you know, the worst situations. Yeah, definitely. So I totally hear you 100% on self custody. And so these things take time, unfortunately. And because of the world we live in, we don't have that time. Um, so I think that's why there's that appeal of the ETF, right? It's like, okay, well, I'll just put it like I do all my other assets and I don't have to worry about it. Not realizing that you're taking on all sorts of third party and counterparty risks and so forth. You're not necessarily sure like what they are or not lending out underneath the hood to make yeah. um, to make fees be lower, right? You don't necessarily know if the custodian itself is going to have issues, right? Like Coinbase, for instance, has all these litigation now again like with the sec is litigating them and so forth um and so they're basically the custodian for nearly 100 percent of these etfs right and so um there are all these other hidden risks that we don't really think about and we change them for the ease right it's like almost a low time preference versus high time preferencing it's like it's easy to buy the etf and not worry about this and have somebody else deal with all the custody stuff um but at the other the other side of that the way to look at it is that okay there's all these hidden risks that i can't really possibly fathom or understand. Um, and maybe they won't come to fruition, but maybe they will, right? And maybe then the risk I should be taking is trusting that I can do this, right? And so um, like, I think that if you take baby steps to do it, then yeah, it's going to be okay. If you, you know, throw all of your, right, if you take a big position in Bitcoin, you throw all of it on one hardware wallet and you don't store, store it properly, then yeah, I would <laughs> totally be worried. Um, and I mean, worse, like not doing, like sometimes people don't do like these test transactions and so forth, right? Like doing yeah. test transactions is important. Um, definitely uh, there are, there are collaborative custody solutions where people don't actually have to hold even two of the three keys. Um, I think Unchained actually came out with one where you can have even all three keys be held by institutions or you hold one and then two different institutions hold two. So obviously you're taking more risk, right? Because you're inter introducing more institutions. Um, and then like uh, OnRamp has a similar product where there's three different institutions and client doesn't really take any custody. Um, but these are ways to sort of ease into, okay, in the meantime, while I'm trying to learn how to use my hardware wallet, there are solutions out there for me where I still don't have to take the risk of being on an exchange or being in an ETF um, that would be appropriate for me. And then me and my family members, we can all learn how to do this. And when we're ready, we take custody. Um, that's the ultimate goal. I know that the uh, the providers of these custody products, they don't like to hear <laughs> to hear that maybe as much, right? Because then it means down the line that revenue is going away. But I think that there'll always be people that come in. There'll be people that hopefully leave and learn how to do this themselves. Um, the ultimate Ultimately, though, having some form of collaborative custody, whether it be really you set up your own two of three multi-sig all on your own, but, you know, maybe your adult children hold a hardware wallet and then you hold the other two. Even something like that where you're not even using a third party, I think makes sense from an estate planning perspective. So I think it's really going to depend on who you're leaving your money to what the purpose of it is, right? There's many factors as to like why you would either pick an institution to be the third key holder or why you would pick maybe a family member to do it. If you have minor children, it's probably going to make sense to just have the institution hold it and then notify whatever, whoever the trustee is going to be for those children that mm -hmm. they in fact have to go through a place like Unchained Capital or OnRamp or any of the others, right? To um, to basically like execute the will and so forth. Um, generally wills, it makes sense, especially if you have minor children to have a testamentary trust in place. And so you're your Bitcoin would basically pour into that testamentary trust and then the testamentary trust would basically be created on one of these platforms and the trustee would then maybe hold one of the keys. You can probably set it up where like a trustee holds one and then two different institutions hold one and then the trustee can like, you know, ease themselves into holding keys, right? Because the other issue is that, okay, you're a hardcore Bitcoiner, you know how to do everything. Okay, you trained your wife up on it. You both die and now your trustee doesn't know how to do this, right? There's a, there's like a lot of different things that are going on right now because this is so new. And so they're yeah. like, I think that in addition to thinking about like, how everyone in the family can actually use Bitcoin and learn how to use Bitcoin and take self custody. You also have to be thinking about the people outside of the plan who, God forbid, the worst case scenario happened. What would ha what it would be like for them? Um, and so, these are just things for sure that we're thinking about. Um, and the custody thing, though, is it's a big deal for sure, um, and it takes practice. And what we re generally recommend is that people have like Bitcoin night where um, depending on the age of your kids, you can have your kids even do it. You know, if they're probably like eight and up, they could probably do it too, where you send, you know, $10 around on the Lightning Network all night. Um, or you, you know, everyone practices doing an on-chain transaction. It's kind of hard to do $10 with 
transaction fees where they're where they are yeah. right now but kind of get the point it's like you know instead of going to a movie you spent 10 bucks on transaction fees you know and the whole family had fun type of thing <laughs> now those are some really good tips and i think that this is an industry that's really going to grow um to help people with collaborative custody and estate planning um great advice and i it's they're not my sponsor but i do use unchained for this they have really helped me out i do have a link in my show notes for anyone interested again they're not my sponsor but i really believe in the services they offer um before we start to wrap up, Morgan, I know that you wanted to talk about the CFP board's informal inquiry of the Bitcoin Financial Advisors Network. What is that? Yeah, so um, I'm part of a, a website. It's a directory of financial advisors that all advise on Bitcoin. And so there are less than a dozen of us. Um, there's, I think, eight or oh, nine really? of us. Yeah. Okay. And um, okay. we are like Bitcoin financial planners, I would say. We all have CFPs. Um, we're all fee-only practitioners, which means that we minimize or don't have any conflicts of interest because we're independent. Um, and we advise on Bitcoin. And so we created a, um, a website, a network where people could find it through, through it basically being a directory. Mm -hmm. Um, the CFP Board of Enforcement, for whatever reason, found out about our website and decided that they don't like something about it. And so they sent everybody on the website letters. Um, and the letters basically asked us to provide information about our client bases, um, about what we're doing in regards to Bitcoin, how clients are custodying their assets, um, and whether or not yeah. we agree with the practices of other advisors in the network. And so um, it is yet to be seen, actually, whether or not this is a... Um, I guess, a vicious wow. attempt or if this is in good faith. Um, and so uh, all wow. of our responses were due last week. And so everybody submitted them. Um, but yeah, I mean, why? I guess I, I'm sort of dumbfounded by this because we are like, all of us are sort of the, the top in our industry, right? And I'm not saying this because I'm trying to toot my own horn or anything here, but like we've gone out of our way to learn about Bitcoin. We've gone out of our way to help clients who have specific issues that other advisors can't solve. Um, we've gone out of our way to be like, uh, like have the designation of the CFP to be like highly professional yeah. to um, run these low conflict, independent firms, right? Like we're doing everything that you're supposed to do in the industry. And then we're also being singled out because we're advising on Bitcoin. And so um, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sort of dumbfounded as to why they're going about that or like what their intent is there. Um, and so it's yet to be seen. And for sure, we'll keep you updated and apprised on, on any information that we get. But in the meantime, I mean, they didn't even like they did literally no research to the point where they called me Mr. Rochard. Mm. It's like, OK, guys, like at least like maybe go yeah. on my website and see whether or not I'm a boy or girl, you know? Um, oh my gosh. I mean, honestly, this doesn't surprise me because I do feel like the powers in existence, the power structures will want people to own Bitcoin in a way where everything will be monitored and everything is fully compliant. And so they want to weed out anyone that potentially could you know, be sending Bitcoin somewhere they don't want or have an amount that they're curious, where did that come from? And it's just, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out in the next 10 years, because you you alluded to the surveillance state, um, talked about it on on my show. I mean, I want to hope for the best, but I think this will be part of the then they fight us stage of the battle for self-custody versus, you know, the forces of control. So I don't know if you have any any notes on that, but yeah, it's going to be wild. Yeah, I mean, my opinion on it is this, right? If you're custodying your assets properly, it's going to be highly unpopular, no matter kind of really what climate we're in, unless we're in a really, really, really bad political climate for people to be going door to door, mm -hmm. um, sma literally smashing down doors without warrants and taking people's Bitcoin. And so like, I think it's a lot easier, given the surveillance state that we do live in, for people to maybe swipe assets off of exchanges or seize ETF funds or seize yeah. really any funds, right? Like they can do that right now. And they okay. have shown that they do do things like that. And so the more we, we fight back by taking self-custody, right? the more of a chance that we have because it's so unpalatable and so un-American to go door to door doing something like that. And so I just like, I think that that's why I really do see the ETF as noise. Cause it's like, okay, this is not, this is not helping our situation here, right? It's actually making it easier for the government to have the oversight that they have currently had. That's really unconstitutional to begin with. And so the more that we're able to um, take 
custody of our assets to show that we're self-sovereign, the more of a chance that we have. That said, I will say, and the one thing I did see, at least with GBTC, was that as clients got interested and got access to something like yeah. GBTC, it was a gateway. Mm -hmm. So yeah. not to be like a gateway drug or anything, but it kind of... <laughs> kind of has that like appeal of like, oh, I dip my toe in the water and I got a little GBTC and now I want to own Bitcoin yeah. outright. And now I own Bitcoin I outright. Oh, it's not so difficult. Like I can buy a little bit more and a little bit more. And the next thing you know, they have 50% of their net worth in Bitcoin. So I that. that's I what that. I guess like the optimistic take on the ETF would be that. Yeah. You don't have to be an ETF maxi. It could be your gateway drug to the, the self-custody Bitcoin. I love that. Um, okay. Morgan, last question I really wanted to ask you, since you do deal probably with a lot of couples, um, I think you mentioned earlier that it's usually the woman who isn't as risky and maybe wants to make sure that the family's saving a little bit more. Uh, do you find that it's it's women who maybe have more of an issue investing a lot of money into Bitcoin and what will bridge that gap? Yeah, so it's a really good question, honestly, and I wish I had a perfect answer for you. I have found that either couples are on board together, much like, you know, Pierre and I were, you know, known for being the two Bitcoiners, whatever. Um, you and Sam, right? Same yeah. thing. Um, and so, like, right, you meet, you meet your spouse and they're into it and everything's fine. Or, you know, you meet your spouse and then for whatever reason, you like took this weird turn as the husband and you read, you know, the Bitcoin standard. And next thing you know, you have 20 book, like Bitcoin books on your shelf. And all you do is listen <laughs> to Bitcoin podcasts and you like talk at your wife, you know, <laughs> you're literally like talking at her about Bitcoin. And she's like, uh, 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 you know, I just, I don't care. Um, and so I think that the communication is key. Um, the way to get your spouse on board, the way to make sure that you and your spouse not only have the same ability to take risk, but the same willingness to take risk is to listen to each other and to be open to conversation and for it actually to be okay that you guys don't have the same opinion on everything. I think that we often think, okay, if we're married, we have to just be the same person. We have to agree on everything all the time. Otherwise, there's going to be conflict in our marriage and conflict's no good. Oh, no, we got to sweep conflict under the rug. No, like you're two individual people, right? Like you're going to have differences of opinions on things. And yeah, there are going to be differences of opinions on things that really matter. That's kind of the way life is, right? And so that's on purpose. That's by design because you're not supposed to be the same two people. And so the point is not that you have the same opinion. The point is that you have enough like respect and love for your spouse because you're on the same team to have open conversations about these things and get to a place where you can agree on it. And so the more I see people have these open conversations, the easier it is for couples to move along. Um, as far as bridging the gap for women, I mean, I think that in some ways it's it's an interest thing. Um, and so, right, the fiat world's not really that interesting either. Um, and so women do other things, right, and that they find more interesting. Um, and I think that from a sociological standpoint that that probably makes sense. Um, and also from a sociological standpoint, maybe doesn't make as much sense because women do run households and so forth and have a lot of other jobs that are actually related to finances, even though they don't necessarily see it that way. And so it is maybe not necessarily an education thing, but making it a uh, making it interesting for women, I think, is the way to get women on board. Um, and so, I, honestly, I think the more we say educate, the more we repel women. Because <laughs> it's like, oh, you're so stupid. You don't know anything about Bitcoin, right? Like, let me teach it to you. It's like, let me mansplain to you right now about Bitcoin. Instead of just being like, how can we make this more interesting for you? Um, because what I've found even is that with women in my, in my practice who really aren't that interested in what's going on in the fiat life is that if we make that more interesting for them, if we find the thing that is interesting to them and we bring them in with that thing, mm -hmm. right? There's always going to be a different catch for every single woman. Then it's going to be more palatable and be something that they want to have a part in. Yeah, good point. And and as far as the couples, the only thing you have to agree on is Rothbard, right? Um, yeah. But no, I, I agree with so many points that, that you made. It's funny because I have so many girlfriends who I've talked to about Bitcoin and I've tried to teach them about Bitcoin and I've led them to the water and I've told them about the books and they're just not there. Maybe a couple have bought a little bit here and there, but I'm just, I'm not able to really entice them to want to understand and be as passionate as I am. But yet the, they will spend hours on Instagram looking at like recipe videos or, or travel videos or do it, do it yourself things for the house. And I'm like, gosh, yeah. if we could just mold some somehow those worlds of Bitcoin content. For that's, sure. That's for healthy. sure. Um, but no, thank I you think so also much, like Morgan. Number go up technology is just not as exciting to women. And I think for a good reason, right? Like I think that we're not actually supposed to be wired to be like, wow, look at, you know, <laughs> this crazy yeah, investment number going up. 
Yeah. Yeah. The tra- yeah it's yeah, like trading thing has never been my thing for sure. Yeah, for sure. So there's got to be another way to get people involved. And I, you know what? I'm sure we can come up with something. Well, we're working on it. All right, Morgan, this has been so great. Where do you want to send people? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Morgan with an E Rochard. I'm working on a a book right now. It's called the Bitcoin personal finance book. If you want to um, get emails about updates, um, you can go to the landing page, bitcoinpersonalfinancebook.com. Um, my financial planning practice is originwa.com. And my Bitcoin consulting practice is moneyowners.com. Perfect. I will have all those links in the show notes. Morgan Richard, such a pleasure. I hope to have you back on soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Coin Stories podcast brought to you by BitDeer. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any new content. This show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open if you want to share feedback or guest suggestions. You can reach me at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. I'll see you next time.